Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started here. We don't want to keep everyone waiting. So hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to our webinar about maximizing the incentives and rebates for air source heat pumps, which will include a live q and I'm very excited to be here tonight and see the number of people who are interested and the number of people who signed up. So we definitely have a very engaged group, which is wonderful. And this is a very exciting thing to learn about. So you may have heard the notification that this session is being recorded. And for the Q&A portion, um, you can enter your questions into the Zoom Q&A. And we have a number of questions that were already submitted. So we'll go through the submitted questions and then open it up to the live questions. And I think that we will do our best to get to every question. We have 90 minutes allotted. And if there are questions that we don't get to, we will answer them after the fact and we'll send them out in a post event email. So we will get your questions answered. Just a reminder that there's a pause play functionality. So if you have to step away, you can pause it and then play and catch up. And as I mentioned before, you'll receive an email after the webinar that will include a link to the recording, our contact information, answers to any remaining questions and additional resources about air source heat pumps. So just as some background here, RMLD and Abode, who you'll be hearing from in a little while, we have we've held some successful heat pump webinars. So one was in March of 2021, and another one was in November of 2021. And those really got into the nitty gritty of the technology. And we will be giving an overview tonight. But we do recommend that you look at those if you're interested in installing a heat pump for more information. And the reason why we're having this as a Q&A is because RMLD gets a lot of questions about heat pumps as they're relatively new to the area. And we get a lot of interest in rebates, which we'll also touch on. And since there are, are a lot of misconceptions about heat pumps and a lack of awareness about how they work and their benefits. So that's another reason why we're here today. And I'm sure after how hot it's been this summer, a lot of people are rethinking how you cool their home, which is where heat pumps can help you. So tonight's agenda, we'll be going over um, about RMLD. I'm sure you're familiar with us, but we'll give some more backgrounds. Um, my colleague Ajay will be talking about our electrification efforts and our partnership with Abode and more information on our air source heat pump program. And Travis from Abode will be giving an overview about Abode and the basics of heat pumps and the options and operations. And then we will open it up to our Q&A and link to additional resources. So about RMLD, I'm sure that most of you are our, are our customers, so you know about us, but just as a refresher, we're a not-for-profit municipal, municipally owned electric utility, and we were established in 1894. And we service Reading, North Reading, Wilmington, and Linfield Center and have an area of 51 square miles. We serve over 70,000 people and we have 29,000 meter connections. And we have a five member board of commissioners who are elected by Reading voters who help govern the utility as well as a five member citizens advisory board who are appointed by our, the communities in our territory. And all of our meetings are open to the public and you can visit our website for dates if you are interested in attending either in person or virtually. So more about RMLD is that we offer energy efficiency, conservation and electrification programs to increase awareness and accelerate adoptions of practices, products and technologies. And these include helping customers use energy more efficiently in their home and business. So we have audit programs that touch on that as well as some other programs. And reducing RMLD's electricity usage during expensive peak demand times. You might be familiar with our Shred the Peak alerts. And if you're not, we recommend that you sign up. 
and we help the environment by reducing carbon emissions and increase electrification, which Ajay will be discussing more in detail. And all of our programs are funded by the energy conservation charge, which is on your electric bill. And I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Ajay. Thank you, Julie. Um, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about electrification. So electrification is in short, um, the process of replacing appliances that burn things uh, with electric equivalents. This can be in transportation with electric vehicles, industrial processes, and important for us, heat pumps for heating, cooling, and water heating. So one of the key um, drivers for us is the 2021 Massachusetts climate law, um, which is pushing us to um, push towards net zero greenhouse gas emissions on power. And part of that is electrification. You know, natural gas is still a fossil fuel, for example. Next slide, please. So to that end, we have a lot of electrification programs. A lot of them are rebates as well. For example, we have a rebate for electric vehicle chargers. We have a rebate for electric panel upgrades, which will be valuable for electrifying a home if you have, say, a little tiny 100 amp panel. We have rebates for cordless electric yard equipment, which are very nice, and for heat pump water heaters, which are also incredibly cool. But crucially, next slide, please. We have a pretty huge air source heat pump program for, nope, air source heat pumps. Next slide, please. This program is two-pronged. First, we have a rebate structure for residential and commercial customers. We really kicked this program up in gear in 2020, um, and it's, it's been really fun to help work on that. And on the other side, we offer education and technical support for customers and contractors via Abode. Um, Abode provides resources for customers to get a sense of what the technology is and what to expect, and also on the contractor side to make sure they also know what to look for, how to install these things, and what to tell customers. Overall program performance, uh, it's been going gangbusters, I believe is the technical term. Um, we have received over 150 applications to date in 2022 alone. Um, it's about pace with where it was last year, and um, it's, it's going super well. This, this is a really exciting program to work on. Um, our heat pump program is pretty straightforward. Um, it's $1,000 per ton for new air source heat pumps for almost every case. And it enca encapsulates central air source heat pumps, multi-zone and single zone mini split heat pumps. Um, keep in mind, if you ever heard the term mini split or heat pump or air source heat pump, those are all referring to the same kind of system. Um, keep that in mind. Next slide, please. So a key part of this program is about energy management, the partner company that we work with to help make this program work as smoothly as possible. It's really, really great working with these folks. Next slide, please. Um, on the key program side, they help with pre-approval um, before the system is installed. This is required for uh, the rebate. You have to go to the pre-approval first. I know there was a question about that in the chat. Um, you need the pre-approval first to make sure the system is designed properly, sized properly. And then once you have the system installed, Abode provides a post-install quality assurance to make sure the system was installed properly, collect some photos, and help us process the rebate that way. There are also some extra optional resources for customers. Um, we can You can connect to heat pump specialists who will help you walk through any point of the shopping and installation process. Make sure you kind of know what's looking, what you're looking at. If you're looking at a quote or looking at three quotes, they'll help you walk through what those quotes actually mean. And we also, and Abode also provides a participating contractor list of contractors who know the system, know the rebate program, know what they're doing. You don't have to go with these participating contractors, but it's a very, very good starting point if you're not sure where to start. Uh, next slide, please. And um, overall, Abode has been doing a fantastic job. They're fantastic to work with on the RMLD side, and our customers love working with Abode as well. It's they're great folks, they, they're, and they really know what they're doing. Um, with that, let's uh, pass to uh, Travis from Vote to talk a little more about heat pumps in, in, in specific. Yeah, thanks, Ajay, uh, and thank you all for joining tonight. Um, just as a quick background, some of these slides might be a little redundant if you've attended some of our previous uh, deeper dive trainings. And so there's a handful of core things we're going to focus on today um, and try to get through so we have plenty of time for uh, the Q&A, of which we've got lots of great questions already coming in. 
just as a quick background, uh, BOAT is a Concord-based uh, organization. We launched about five years ago. We run heat pump programs for about 21 communities throughout Massachusetts. We also manage the MassSafe home performance contractors. So for many folks in here that have participated in MassSafe, uh, depending on the type of contractor you've used, that's actually flown under uh, our purview as a program administrator. We run similar programs in Connecticut as a statewide uh, vendor for the Energized CT program. And uh, more recently, we're leading in the Mass uh, CEC Decarbonization Pathways Program, which aims to help uh, develop a pilot to demonstrate the both cost effectiveness and process for fully decarbonizing homes. Next slide, please. Uh, as I noted, we've done a lot with a lot of folks, uh, and we have continued to grow this program based on the success of, uh, you know, all of the great innovation with partners like RMLD and others. Next slide, please. And, you know, at the end of the day, uh, we, we've worn multiple hats in this ecosystem. Um, we are lead vendors and administrators of programs for many years, uh, myself and many of my team were contractors working within programs, whether it was around home performance and including energy assessments, weatherization, or the cells and install of heat pumps, solar, and other kind of decarbonization solutions. We've been on the contractor side and have a really good understanding. Uh, we have great relationships with installers and manufacturers. And at the end of the day, we're customers too. So I'm actually a Reading resident. I have two kiddos that go to Birch Meadow. I am a town meeting member here in Reading as well, a member of the Reading Climate Advisory Committee. So, um, you know, as an organization, we really are dedicated to, you know, playing active roles in our community, um, and doing what we can to help add value throughout. Next slide, please. So the focus of today is gonna to be more about what happens during these kind of consultations, what to expect, and really helping you as someone who's exploring heat pumps, uh, be really well prepared to speak with a contractor. We wanna make sure that you know the right questions to ask, that you're able to clearly articulate what you want to get out of heat pumps, why you're exploring them. Contractors really appreciate that. They want customers to have a really clear understanding of what they're needing because that helps them better develop solutions for you at the end of the day. And that's really the goal of our consultations is to help prepare you to make uh, an informed and confident decision. Slide, please. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but the punchline is everybody already has a heat pump in your house. Um, if you have a refrigerator running right now, um, you should go check on it and go catch it. That was my bad dad joke for the whole presentation. Stop there with those. But the idea here is that uh, the concept of a heat pump is nothing new. This is a technology that has existed for quite some time. And, you know, and throughout other parts of the world, heat pumps are the primary heating and cooling uh, for, for many countries. In the United States, it is a, a more recent kind of advent in terms of really being adopted at scale. And a lot of that has to do with the innovations around cold climate heat pumps. So the heat pumps that we're really focused on helping uh, folks explore and ultimately adopt, if it makes sense, are systems that can actually meet your heating needs here in Massachusetts, here in Reading, um, effectively when they are sized and designed correctly. There was one question in the chat already around, uh, you know, can you get a heat pump that just does heat or just does cooling? Um, when we're saying heat pumps, we are going to be universally referring to systems that do both heating and cooling. And for the sake of this conversation, we're gonna be focused on systems that have that capacity and that efficiency to uh, meet the average home's uh, heating load, again, if they're sized and designed correctly. Um, when you think about how heat pumps work, the main thing is that we have uh, a system that is moving heat from one space to another. So if it is uh, really cold outside and you want your house to be warmer, even though it's really cold outside, there's still heat in the air and a heat pump is able to capture that heat and help move that heat into the inside of your house and vice versa. If it's really hot outside and you want your house to be cooler, we're pulling heat out of the house to effectively get it to a comfortable space. Next slide, please. So this slide is gonna take a little bit of uh, kind of explanation to wrap your mind around, but it's one that I think is really one of the most critical things that we can share tonight. So this slide is intended to help folks really understand the cost of energy as it relates to your more conventional heating systems and fuel types that you're used to compared to heat pumps. So just starting on the left side with these beige graphs, these are gonna be your heating systems and fuel types that you're used to, making some standard assumptions around efficiency. We're taking an assumption that, for example, you have a relatively high efficiency gas system in this case. Uh, as you move down 
uh, getting to oil, for example, most oil systems kind of at best are peaking at around 87% efficient, which means for every unit of energy that it's putting into it, 87% of that energy is able to be transferred out as usable heat. Um, the thing that I really want folks to dive in or focus initially is that uh, arrow right in the middle in that first blue bar. So what this is showing is the seasonal performance of a heat pump related to the seasonal performance of all of these other fuel types. We're using a two color stack bar here for a very important reason. And that is to really help drive home the fact that not all heat pumps are created equal. When you're thinking about heat pumps and we're thinking about, you know, how do you uh, kind of prepare you and your household budget for whether or not this is a good decision, it's important to know that there are cold climate heat pumps that are rebate eligible that don't necessarily maintain the same degree of efficiency compared to other systems. And this is not a manufacturer specific issue. This is true for all manufacturers within all of their product lines. They have varying degrees of efficiency. So just like they have varying degrees of efficiency, they have varying degrees of cost as well. So one might find that a system that has a lower efficiency has a also uh, correlating lower upfront cost. And so then it becomes a decision about where you want to spend your money. Do you want to have a higher upfront cost in some cases with lower operational cost during the course of that system? Or do you want to have uh, vice versa, a higher upfront cost but lower operation? One thing that is also important to note is that as you see that uh, second arrow bar that says 80% of the heating season. So that's meant to represent the fact that getting down to around 21 degrees on up, that is about 81 or 80% rather of the total time you're gonna be using your heat pump to heat your home. So there is only a limited amount of time during the year when you're gonna be using it when its efficiency might not be as good as it otherwise might be at uh, warmer temperatures. There's a question in the chat as well about how low can a heat pump uh, go and still heat a home. It depends on the system and the manufacturer that you have. It also depends kind of on how well insulated your home is, uh, if the system is sized and designed properly. But one thing that's important to keep in mind is that it's not like a light switch. So it's not, there's no magic number at which a heat pump just kind of theoretically stops working. Most of these systems, when you look at their spec sheets or when you're speaking to contractors, they'll talk about systems being rated down to five degrees. Um, there are many manufacturers right now, Mitsubishi and others that have systems that are rated down to negative 15 degrees. that will still be able to provide a meaningful amount of heat. What's important to consider is that as you get colder and colder, those systems are gonna have to work harder and harder. And because they are electricity based and powered, that means they're going to pull more electricity. And that's just part of the trade-off is that when it's really, really cold out, they're gonna pull more KWH or more electrons out of the grid. But during that 80% window of the time when you're using your systems, they're gonna be generally better than just about everything else, especially if you get a higher performing system. So I know there's a lot on this slide and I've probably said a lot of things that uh, maybe don't make a ton of sense in this moment, but this is where when you're speaking to uh, a heat pump consultant as part of the RMLD program, we're gonna help navigate this. So when you start to get quotes from contractors, we encourage you to bring them back and let us do the analysis and really help you understand where does your system fall on this kind of bar chart in terms of its performance? Is it one of the ones that maintains its efficiency and is competitive with natural gas for the majority of the heating season? Or is it one that's gonna be a little bit north of natural gas? And maybe you don't even have an option for natural gas. Maybe you're like me and oil is the only thing that you have an option for or propane. Um, in all circumstances, even the lower performing ones are gonna be at or better than, uh, than oil. So that's important to remember. My final comment on the slide, is that uh, the prices that were used for this were uh, based on mass.gov's current fuel oil prices, for example, of 370 a gallon. Um, I'm not sure how many people have refilled recently, but uh, I think that folks are typically spending more than 370 a gallon. That is the annualized seasonal season adjusted price for the last year. So we should expect that 
if you were to plug in the four dollars and 30 40 cents that people are paying right now that savings versus oil is going to look even better than it does and it's also worth noting that because we are rmld customers our electricity rate is significantly less than some of our surrounding communities uh, that have uh, you know ever sourced a national grid um, and so there's a nice benefit and kind of extra kicker for adopting heat pumps here in rmld I think I beat that slide to death. Let's go to the next one. <laughs> uh, this one I'm going to just glaze over pretty fast. We talked a lot about this one in one of our previous presentations. Um, the punchline here is that there are a lot of motivations for adopting heat pumps. Uh, many families are looking at this because it is an opportunity to maybe add air conditioning to a house that desperately needs it or to uh, get off of fossil fuels and save some money off of oil. Many families are looking at this and taking into consideration the environmental impact. And so when you have heat pumps, you are kind of out of the gate already reducing your environmental impact, particularly when you consider the fuel or the uh, generation mix of RMLD. And when you combine heat pumps with some of the uh, programs that are available, whether it's rooftop solar on your own home or the solar or renewable choice programs that are offered by RMLD, you really drive down the environmental impact of heating and cooling your home. Next slide, please. So again, we've talked a little bit about heat pumps. It's a broad category. Um, the main thing that we're focused on right now are going to be the air-to-air -air systems. So again, these are systems that are kind of either a central heat pump, think about ductwork in your house going all throughout, uh, multi-zone and single-zone uh, mini-split and multi-split systems, as well as kind of a combination of units. There are air-to-water heat pumps specifically right now. Uh, the most common application of that is for a heat pump hot water heater. I've got one in my house here I've had for over three years, uh, family four, it's cranking out, works great, saves significantly over what was there before, which was an electric resistance hot water heater. Um, there are also new advancements in air to water heat pumps that are kind of in the pipeline, although uh, they're still kind of just now finding their place here in the market with some major manufacturers. Um, a lot of folks are interested in geothermal, which can be a great solution, particularly if you have uh, the space uh, to have the drilling going. And there are some great companies now that are coming around with some more uh, compact rigs that make it a little bit easier to explore. But for today's presentation and conversation, we're gonna be focused on the air to air, but that doesn't mean there aren't other great solutions out there. Next slide, please. Um, so specifically thinking about what do these things look like? And this is an important thing when I talk to folks just to kind of help them really understand, you know, what are you getting yourselves into? So folks typically uh, think about heat pumps or mini splits, and they imagine the wall hung unit there on the left. Um, that is by far kind of the most common that we've seen. And for many years, uh, the major manufacturers, that was kind of almost all they did exclusively. That's changing. And I think it's a good thing. In the center here, there's a floor mounted system. This is the exact same kind of concept as that wall hung unit, except for it's on the floor. It's a little bit shallower. Um, and it can be installed on interior walls underneath uh, by running all of the uh, lines through the basement. This is, I think, a really great solution for a lot of folks like myself. I live in a small cape. I don't have a lot of exterior wall space to hang a wall-mounted unit, but I do have some really great spots for a floor-mounted unit that I can access because I have an unfinished basement. So we're seeing a lot of folks uh, gravitating towards these as part of their first floor solutions. Um, uh, second to that then are the idea of ceiling cassettes. And so just like uh, thinking about coming up from the basin, a lot of folks are also having these systems that are being installed with the distribution from the ceiling. So if you have an unfinished attic or an accessible attic um, that you can get to, this becomes a really great opportunity to put a system in without taking up any nice valuable wall space as well. Next slide, please. As far as our ducted uh, variations go, there are three kind of core ones. Um, one, again, thinking about folks that might have a, a small room set up, and I saw there was a question earlier about, you know, having a cape, for example, that uh, had six rooms in it. A lot of times what we're seeing are folks, especially on the upstairs of a cape, which is what I'm in right now, um, using these discrete or we also call them short run ducted uh, systems. These typically are able to connect two rooms that are you know, pretty close to adjacent together or you know, relatively close. Um, and that allows kind of one system on the outside to power it. So you get better kind of distribution of that energy. Next to that is the idea of a compact ducted. This one we see more often coming from the basements. And this is when you have a little bit more uh, kind of think about it, an entire floor that you're going to be treating. And then finally, the central ducted, which has gotten a lot of popularity. We're seeing this actually. Uh, make significant strides in market share in 2022. And this is typically your whole home solution. 
This is really, really common for folks that have already had a central AC installed in their house, but it is either gone out, needs to be replaced, or they're wanting to replace their heat pump anyways. This allows for heating and cooling to leverage those existing ductwork um, to get a whole home solution. And I think is, you know, especially uh, when folks are concerned about kind of comfort, this is one of the best solutions that we're seeing. And we're actually seeing the performance of these in the last couple of years jump significantly. So we're really excited about the fact that this is actually becoming a really viable option for a lot of homes. Next slide, please. Um, when we're talking to you, it's not just about where do you want to put these systems and what are kind of your goals and your housing layout. But we're also trying to figure out, you know, how much of your home do you want to heat? If you're looking for, uh, you know, an addition that needs to be treated because uh, maybe it was added in the 1990s and it had electric resistance, but the rest of the house is all set, you know, then we say, great, a single zone system is probably going to be a good fit for you. And we talked about how it should be sized and what you need to be thinking about. A lot of folks also like to, the idea of kind of having some redundancy. And so they think, okay, I want to maintain or keep my, uh, my oil or gas fired system because it's not dead. It doesn't need to necessarily be replaced yet. I just want something that's more efficient and cleaner, but I want to have it just in case. And in those scenarios, we often try to help people think about the concept of integrated controls, um, especially if you have a, a relatively new gas uh, system that you want to continue to use. We want to make sure that you're maximizing the use of your heat pumps and, and then having it complemented by the gas system if you ultimately try to do that. So integrated controls are something that we often talk to folks about. And basically what that means is how do you automate the turning on and turning off or switching in between your heat pumps and the backup uh, heating source. Next slide, please. Um, we've already kind of talked up a little bit about the zones and thinking about like how many rooms do you want to be conditioning here and what are the size and the layout? So, you know, again, if you have a big open floor plan, a lot of times we're seeing folks install one wall mounted unit that's on the larger side that can support a, a big volume of space, even cathedral ceilings and, and otherwise. If you have a lot of small rooms, we often try to think about how can we structure a design that uh, maximizes the efficiency of your outdoor systems as well as making sure that you're getting the comfort to those rooms that really need it. And these are important kind of things for you to think about before you start talking to a contractor. There are so many great contractors out there. There are also some that aren't always amazing. And I think that one of the things that you can do as an informed buyer is come to the table with some context about what you need and what you're trying to achieve. I mentioned early on that, you know, a good contractor will appreciate that. A good contractor will appreciate the fact that you have some context about what these systems can do and sometimes can't do. And they'll also appreciate the fact that you have an idea of how you want to uh, tackle this problem. I will say that when we're working with residents, um, we oftentimes kind of give advice in the context of ask your contractor these two or three questions and they'll help really dial in what the solution is. Since we're not necessarily in your home, we're not, we're not always in the best position to make you know, a very firm or explicit recommendation outside of kind of industry best practices. And so that's where having a contractor that you kind of trust and can, you can work with becomes really important. Next slide, please. Uh, you've heard me mention a few times, single zone, multi-zone. So just real fast, all that basically means is how many indoor units are connected to the outdoor unit. Um, a single zone is a one-to-one -one versus a multi-zone as the name would imply would be one-to-many. Um, over the last few years, the technology around multi-zones has continued to improve. There was a time um, where a lot of the major manufacturers' single zone systems just really did perform significantly better in terms of their efficiency than the multi-zone counterparts. Um, the technology, again, has improved to a point where that's not always true, um, but you know, it's important to ask your contractor about that and have a contractor that's willing to engage and to understand that maybe it's worth splitting up this one room with its own outdoor unit and then having the rest of the house served by a multi-zone because of the sizing uh, that might uh, be being addressed. Next slide, please. Um, the biggest thing to keep in mind here is that there's a large range of cost. Um, it's not just your design considerations that go into this as we've already talked about. Um, it's you know your home size, just how much heating you actually need to achieve. And they do typically, we size these systems based on the heating load, because in New England, that is gonna be greater than our cooling load. So if a system was sized only for cooling for your house, it won't be big enough to effectively heat your home. Um, the other things that can impact your cost here are, you know, do you need a service panel upgrade? 
Um, it's great that RMLD is one of the few MLPs in the state that offers incentives around that because that is often um, a barrier for a lot of folks when you have a home that is uh, on the older side, you know, 1950s construction or 60s construction, uh, you might need that 200 amp service and upgrading to that uh, isn't always the cheapest thing. So having the benefit of RMLD's rebates certainly helps that. Um, you know, so there's just a lot that goes into this um, and finding a contractor or a couple of contractors and getting a couple of quotes is definitely uh, what we recommend doing. And then if you have questions, bring those back to a boat. That's why RMLD has hired us is to help you navigate this because it's not always easy. It's not always uh, straightforward. And so that nuance is where we really can help support you. Next slide, please. Um, we actually had a presentation about this last year. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on it. The punchline here is that, you know, the heat pumps uh, require a little bit of unlearning to use, whether that is going from thinking about temperature to thinking about comfort, uh, not using setbacks because these systems work best when they're kind of always on at a steady kind of cruise control, if you will, and really understanding the different functionalities, whether it's how or not to use the auto mode or you know how to maintain these, cleaning the filters, just the general uh, kind of things that keep them working well. So we have a whole presentation that's kind of focused on this from last year, um, but this is kind of common stuff that we talk to folks about during those consultations. Next slide, please. Uh, we already touched a little bit on the participating contractor list, but as a reminder, this is a resource for, for you as customers. It is not, uh, you're not required to use any of the contractors on this list, but these are contractors that are familiar with the RMLD process. And so if you are to be working with them, uh, they understand the required steps so that you don't find yourself in a scenario where you may have had a system installed um, yesterday and, and it might not be rebate eligible if the contractor didn't go through the steps. And, and we work really hard to advertise this program and continue to enroll new contractors. And so if there are contractors participating in this call today that want to join it, reach out to us. We'd love to have more contractors on this and be growing this resource for residents. And I think my last slide's coming up, or two slides, yep. And so this is that rebate process uh, it, that Ajay mentioned in terms of a pre-approval form. We do this to provide technical evaluation and kind of gut checking of these uh, proposals to make sure that they're not only rebate eligible, but that they're adhering to industry best practices to best meet your goals. There's an install QA component here that is uh, intended to make sure that these systems are also installed uh, as manufacturers intended. And then a customer survey that is optional at the end that helps us ensure that the contractors that you're working with are providing the right level of customer support and service. And that's all I had. Okay. Awesome, awesome. I wanna to jump to a quick, couple of really, really quick questions that are in the Q&A. Sure. Um, first off, this program is different from MassSave. Um, none of the program, none of the stuff here that we do at, at RMLD is directly associated with MassSave. We, um, we do our own stunts at the shop, if you will. Um, however, if you have natural gas service at your home through National Grid, if you are looking at installing a heat pump, we recommend you look at the mass safe program um, because if you have natural gas heating, you are eligible for the mass safe rebates for heat pumps and they have a whole different set of requirements, um, which, you know, you can check with a contractor about, you can check online about, um, and, you know, we can also help you navigate like a little bit of the intricacies there because it can be complicated. Um, second quick question. Um, one ton of cooling is in fact 12,000 BTUs an hour. Um, you can think of it in terms of tons. The average this is extreme gut estimate for the average writing home, three to four tons is about a house. It depends significantly on what your home is actually like. So a couple quick questions, then we can get to the, uh, the submitted questions here. Sure. Okay. Um, yep. So ready. Want to go through the submitted questions. Um, Travis, are there any in the, chat that you want to answer quickly or we can go to yeah them. i mean there is um a, a recurring theme mm -hmm. of uh, some contractors recommending that you maintain your existing fossil fuel system um a properly sized designed heat pump a cold climate heat pump should be able to without any real risk uh support heating and cooling your home year-round um you know we typically always advise that folks think about the 
uh, kind of energy efficiency and conservation first. So we recommend that folks, if they haven't already had an energy assessment and made the, re uh, the recommended weatherization improvements, that they do that as part of this project. That way you're not uh, essentially uh, heating or conditioning air that's just gonna quickly leave your home. Um, so that is certainly something that's important, but th there are many, many heat pump solutions out there that are, are more than capable of meeting uh, the average home's heating needs without without really any stress at all. So this is an area where we are still having to overcome some misconceptions in the contractor marketplace. Um, there are many contractors that are out there ripping out boilers and furnaces when they do these. Um, so uh, it's clear that some are comfortable with it and some aren't, but the, the science and the data uh, and the real world experience that we're seeing with, you know, I, I, I started working with heat pumps in 2013 here in Massachusetts. So I've seen these things work really well for a lot of people. I've also seen some that haven't. And in most circumstances, we can tell you why they didn't work well. And sizing and design is one of the main reasons. As a key example, my parents are one of those folks who do, just don't have a boiler in their homes anymore. Um, it was a carbon monoxide risk. It was next to my bedroom. It got taken out. They have a heat pump system now. It works better than the old system. <laughs> so... Yeah, you don't you don't need to have the um, if you have a whole home heat pump, you don't need a boiler or furnace anymore. Yeah, and consistent with that, um, there was a question that was asked about the the cooling load, and so yeah, I did mention that because we're in New England, our systems are sized based on the heating loads, um, and most contractors we'll do what's called a manual J, which is a load calculation for the home. We highly recommend it because that will help ensure that you're getting a system that can effectively meet your needs. But uh, so long as your systems are sized for heating, you should have no issues with the cooling. I will say that I've mentioned a few times, the sizing matters. If you oversize a heat pump, um, it's consequential for a couple of reasons. One is that um, it can result in the system not operating as efficiently as it should. So you'll find that it's turning on and off a lot. It's uh, referred to as short cycling. Short cycling um, basically results in a larger electricity draw during that time frame versus a system that's sized smaller and runs at a, at a lower speed more continuously. And so when we've put monitors on systems and have watched, we've been able to see uh, these spikes occur and those oversized systems actually lead to uh, higher bills, uh, decreased in, uh, comfort. And then on the air conditioning side, you actually lose some of the dehumidification benefits that are provided by heat pumps during the summertime because of uh, them being oversized and not being able to get to that run rate state. So um, definitely recommend uh, making sure that these are sized correctly. And I will say for just as another real world example in my own home, um, I have a small cape, as I mentioned, downstairs, we have one heat pump. Uh, it's a one ton system, single zone that is intended to kind of condition the entire downstairs. Um, we, during the summertime, that system just cranks up so much cold air. It's been wonderful to walk into my house and just that one system being able to maintain uh, uh, a high degree of comfort. So uh, that is one of the added benefits is being able to move away from inefficient window units um, and have that air conditioning. Awesome. Cool. Okay, so I will read through um, the submitted questions on the PowerPoint mm -hmm. and then we can go through the questions in the chat and I think there will be yeah. some redundancies. Yeah. So the first question we have, and all the all these questions are wonderful. So everyone did their research and I love how eager and curious everyone is. So this is wonderful. So the first question is with all the labor shortages in high costs, I would like to know more about the DIY path to heat pumps. So air source heat pump installations are, um, you really should have a professional do them. Um, but maybe you are one of those professionals, uh, in which case, uh, go for it. Um, you will still have to apply for a pre-approval. You will still need an electrician to um, pull an electrical permit and do the electrical inspections or, or to pull an electrical inspection. So, so you will still need an electrician um, and you'll, uh, you'll, need, you'll need to be professional, professionally uh, competent to install the heat pump yourself. But um, if you're bad enough to do it, you can do it. <laughs> one thing I would say on that um, is that 
choosing a contractor that has the appropriate certifications and training through manufacturers can help ensure that your system is warranted appropriately and for longer versus uh, using either a contractor that is not um, part of a certification program through one of the major manufacturers. Um, or again, if you're doing it DIY, uh, you, you run that risk uh, of not having that warranty. So I would keep that in mind. And it's always something that we recommend Again, folks ask about as part of their engagement with contractors is, is what are their certifications, trainings, and warranties. Okay, awesome. So next question, in terms of temperature settings, what is the lowest recommended setting for heating and the highest setting for cooling? Assuming for cooling, I would want the humidity level below 60%. Right. Uh, so yeah, that's yeah, that's a, a great question. And we get, get questions all, uh, like this kind of all the time. And it, it really depends on the equipment. Um, as I mentioned, some equipment uh, is rated to effectively go down to negative 15 degrees on their spec sheets and have been tested. Um, you know, it really depends on what you're purchasing and the space that you're conditioning as to what it is. Um, we, we think about whole home systems. I mean, we're really focusing on ensuring that a home can effectively be cooled down to, you know, negative five or so with the heat load. Um, and I think that that's a little bit of an outlier. I mean, we're talking about literally hours out of the year, but those are kind of important hours when you don't really want to uh, be too, too cold. And as I mentioned early at the beginning here, it's not like a light switch. So these systems still have efficiencies. Um, they're still going to work into colder temperatures. Uh, they just might not work as well, and they might cost you a little bit more for those uh, hours when it's exceptionally cold. Um, the flip side on the humidity, there's a lot of things that drive humidity in a home. Um, including how airtight it is. Are you cooking a lot? Um, so, uh, you know, trying to just size a system solely to maintain that humidity level, we just want to keep in mind that uh, there are other factors as well that might drive your ability to, to achieve that. Uh, but you should be able to use these well into our super hot, hot, hot days that we're having right now. <laughs> Hopefully those are behind us. Okay, yeah. next, qu <laughs> next question. There are many days between the hot and cold season that I have no need for heating or cooling. There are days when I just like to have my windows open and let the air flow freely. Can this be accomplished? Absolutely, definitely do it. I enjoy that fresh air. Uh, our houses are full of all sorts of indoor air contaminants. Uh, so I highly recommend if you've got a beautiful day out there uh, and you're comfortable doing it and your allergies aren't gonna go crazy, uh, open those windows and enjoy it. Um, that's one of the nice things. There's a lot of flexibility with these systems. Right. Okay, next question. For homeowners with an existing investment in oil or gas-fired hydronic heat, in our current climate, must the hydronic system be retained to supplement air source heat pumps on very cold days? Um, for context for folks in the chat, um, hydronic means a boiler. Huh. Um, and the answer is uh, you can take it out. It's fine. <laughs> as long as it's sized and designed appropriately, I mean, we just kind of, that's that's the the rhetoric of the drum, you know, we keep saying over and over again, but that really does matter is having a system sized and designed properly. The technology is is more than there. It's been there for a while. Um, and, and we're just seeing continued improvements on top of it. So yeah, you can absolutely do that. And that is why we have the pre-approval. That's <laughs> the number one reason why I have the pre-approvals yeah. for sizing. Um, so there's yeah. a second second part to that question. Is there any near-term prospect for heat pump solutions that can replace the boiler part only of a hydronic system? And yes, you did answer that, correct? Uh, yeah, I'll, I will add to that. I mean, so there are, uh, LG, for example, has an air to water system um, that they are bringing to the Northeast market. Um, and so it's, I wouldn't say, I don't know of anybody yet that has installed one, but I do know that uh, it's it's right around the corner if that's what you're looking for. Awesome. Okay. There might need to be some improvements on your, your distribution though, uh, depending on the size of the, uh, the hydronic pipes. Okay, so our next question comes from a customer with a house on the Cape. I, I like the Cape <laughs> if you ever want guests. So the question, <laughs> I have a house on the Cape that we generally use in the summer and keep heated in the winter at 57 degrees when we're not there. We have a Lennox furnace in our basement and two AC compressors outside. What happens to heat pumps in the winter when snow piles up around them and there's no one there to clean the snow around the unit? 
Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And this actually gets to a part of why we have the install QA as well. So one of the requirements in our programs here is that all systems are um, mounted at least 12 inches off the ground. Uh, many manufacturers now are recommending 12 to 18 inches um, in, in response to resiliency concerns associated not only with snow piles, uh, flooding and others. Um, so we definitely uh, would say that is one of the preemptive steps that you can do. Also knowing kind of how snow has historically maybe piled up in your house, thinking about if there are common areas for snow drift accumulation or uh, for snow melt off of a roof, whether it's going to be dropping ice because of ice dams, which would be unfortunate, or just snow falling off of it and landing on top of the system. These are things that uh, we definitely would encourage you to be very forward uh, with, with your contractors when you're getting quotes and saying, these are some of my concerns. And a good contractor should be able to help navigate those and place systems in a way that mitigates that risk as much as possible. Um, that being said, you know, the systems, um, uh, we ideally don't want them getting fully engulfed in snow. Um, they do have defrost functionalities. Um, but that being said, uh, we, we, would op we, would, we try to help people prevent this from being a problem at the end of the day. Excellent. Okay, so more questions here. Moving right along. So do heat pumps fully cool in heat homes with vaulted ceilings as well as the conventional systems do? Yes. Yeah, I feel like I need a button that says if it's sized and designed properly. <laughs> That's right, right. Have a um, next. If I install a heat pump, do I no longer need to buy propane to heat the house other than for cooking? Correct. And if you buy an induction stove as well, you won't need to buy propane at all. Okay. Just get it for the grill. That's fine. Yeah. And we have a new rebate on those induction stoves. We do. Will... It's $125. Just go on the online portal. <laughs> So the next, um, which, which brand is the most reliable heat pump brand and what kind of servicing is needed each year? Yeah, we get that question a lot. That was one of the first questions that was actually asked in the Q&A here tonight as well. Um, all of our kind of major brands are performing really well from a reliability standpoint. Um, and just on our team alone, uh, we have folks that have Mitsubishi equipment, Fujitsu, Daikin, um, LG, I think we had one person recently installing a Bosch central system. I mean, we're, we're experts in this space and we know that um, particularly for these major manufacturers, uh, we're more concerned with the specs of the specific models versus the brands themselves because each of the major manufacturers has some really amazing equipment and some equipment that leaves some compromise. Um, on the reliability side, I mean, I have not seen any indication yet that makes me pause or be concerned about any of those major manufacturers being installed in my, my mom's house, for example. So um, as far as the servicing that goes with it, I mean, the, one of the most important things is just making sure that filters are clean. These systems need to have clean filters. So make it just a habit of once a month, if you have uh, you know heat pumps, uh, the indoor mini split heads, pull out the filter, rinse it off uh, in the shower, let it dry, then throw it back in there. Um, preventative steps like that will really go a long ways uh, towards, towards supporting that. And then there are some installers that do offer some service plans, um, you know, depending on what your comfort level is for those, that might make sense uh, to have them come and do a checkup on them periodically. Uh, I've had mine for almost four years now. Uh, I've had one checkup on it uh, just to kind of make sure that everything was still tight and looked good and I had a good thorough cleaning on it. Um, so it kind of depends on what your needs are there. Awesome. Okay, next question. What is the typical lifespan of a heating pump unit in Massachusetts? I mean, that most of the main major manufacturers are warranting around 12 years. Um, that being said, when I talk to them uh, kind of on the side at conferences and, and during meetings, uh, many of them are, are projecting 15 to 20 year lifespan for a lot of the pieces of equipment. Um, so it does, uh, it does vary. Some folks are going to have better luck. Some people are going to have systems that seem to run super well forever, just like cars. Some of them perform and meet those goals and some of them don't. Um, so, but we're, we're telling folks to plan for around 12 years, but we are hearing uh, for, with confidence from folks that they anticipate 15 to 20 on some of these systems. That's great. Next question. Do rebate offers require an energy audit by the local utility? How much are the rebates? Well, the local utility is us and uh, you don't, 
need an energy audit. You probably should get one though. They're of no cost. Um, you just sign up on, on the website uh, and just get that sorted. Uh, it's of course no cost to you. Um, so nice to have, not required. Uh, as for the rebates, they are $1,000 per ton. I know someone asked about that. Um, it is $1,000 per ton and it comes as a check in the mail. I know someone else asked about that. And just to also um, for those folks that are National Grid gas customers here, um, that is something that if, if you do, if you haven't had an energy assessment yet, just reach out to Abode and we can connect you with uh, their multiple home performance contractors that service this area. And we'd be happy to help facilitate that for you. Perfect. Okay. Next question. Do heat pumps operate entirely on electricity when power goes down? Is there a backup? Yes, they are 100% electric. I know someone asked about um, how that's considered efficient when we consider refrigerators and air conditioners, a heavy uses of electricity. Um, they are entirely electric. Um, they are quite literally three times more efficient than an electric resistance heater if you have one of those. Um, and crucially, they're a lot more efficient than uh, a gas and oil boiler just from a pure you know, BTUs standpoint. So that's how they're efficient. They're a high load because um, you know, heating and cooling is the biggest energy use for any kind of building in the United States. Um, but they are very efficient at meeting that very, very large load. As for power outages, if they don't have electricity, they don't run. But uh, Reading Light is, and I'm going to brag a little bit, we have astoundingly good reliability for our electric grids. Um, like, like, like notably good reliability. Uh, to the point where there was a point, there was uh, a couple weeks ago, there was a lightning strike that literally exploded a transformer. Like there's very, very dramatic dash cam footage of it. Power was back in four hours. We can just do that. So don't worry too much about power outages. Um, and if you are, um, any kind of like generator system or battery backup can work in a pinch for that kind of setup. When this is, I was going to oh, say, sorry. I, is it, sorry, I has one mute there. Um, I mean, this again is another question that comes up quite often with folks during the consultations. We have to remind, you know, every, not entirely, but majority of the systems that you have in your house right now to heat your home rely on electricity for some component of it. So whether it is a furnace or a boiler, uh, you know, you're going to need electricity for the fans, for the circulator pumps, and otherwise. Um, so if you had a small generator uh, running your boiler, is not as uh, big of a deal, but if you did want to have either some or all of your heat pumps connected to a backup, uh, we definitely recommend connecting with an electrician to properly do that. There are a number of considerations uh, and, and things that can make it work, but it also it does get a little bit expensive. And to Jay's point, um, you know, it is a little bit of a cost benefit and, and risk uh, if you want to consider that about managing those handful of hours that might happen every couple of years without electricity. That doesn't help when there's a massive uh, nor'easter that knocks things out for some period of time. But in that case, even your small generators are probably gonna be in trouble too. Um, so it's worth, worth just kind of balancing out what your risk is, but there are solutions for those that want to, uh, to go down that road. Okay, next question. When one switches from conventional heating and cooling to a heat pump, how much can they expect to save? And I know this is not this a is a very this is this is a very context dependent question. I will uh, assume whole home systems because that's the biggest difference. If you have natural gas heating, it'll come out to a wash, probably a little bit less expensive if you go for a heat pump, considering the way natural gas prices have been versus our electric rates. If you have oil in your home, then you're going to be going from paying a couple thousand dollars for oil over the winter um, to paying a few hundred extra in electricity. Um, again, rough numbers. Uh, there, are, quite frankly, aren't very good numbers. We're looking at getting better numbers, um, but it's it's on the it's on the scale of a few hundred dollars extra for electricity in the winter, um, along with never speaking to your oil company again. Yeah, it, it is important. I, one of the things that 
uh, drives me a little crazy personally as a resident here is seeing a lot of the teardowns and new constructions that are going on and folks putting in propane systems with just a central AC. No one should ever install another central AC ever again. There's do zero reason to do that. Um, if you're going to invest in either adding new ductwork for that, or if you already have ductwork that can support it, that, a heat pump is um, in a marginal cost, literally going to be a couple of hundred dollars more in most circumstances than a conventional air conditioner. And you will be getting uh, heating coverage from a much more efficient uh, source for, you know, a significant portion of your heating season and depending on how it's sliced and designed all of your heating season. Um, so I would just really drive home the point. No one should ever buy another central AC and no one should be installing a propane furnace. Uh, those are antiquated solutions. We have much better solutions that are more cost effective uh, to, to operate and much better for, for all of us. Um, there's also a question kind of in the Q and A that ties to this, but around the air conditioning piece. Um, and so the condensation, and that's where having ductwork that is intended for air conditioning is important. Uh, for folks like me that bought a house that has an oil furnace, my ductwork uh, for my existing uh, distribution will not work with a heat pump. It is old, uh, it is not sealed, it is not insulated. So my solution will be, um, you know, the floor mounted uh, heat pumps like I showed earlier on the top of the one that I already have. So just keep that in mind that just because you have duct work, it doesn't mean you can put in a ducted heat pump, uh, but a good contractor will be able to, uh, to say that. Okay. Moving on to the next um, round of questions here. And I, I think Travis, you touched on this, but seasonal preventative maintenance that can prolong the life yeah. of their heat pump. And that's right, the filter. Yeah, cleaning it right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's one of the biggest things you can do is just keeping these systems clean both inside and out. So, what about having service from a technician just to, you know, make sure it's operating the right way? Is yeah. that recommended? I, 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 I think that um, each manufacturer has kind of their own preference um, as well as uh, contractors, you know, will, will have recommendations. Sometimes some contractors are trying to sell you a service contract because that's just another way that they make money. Uh, other times it might make sense. And so I think that it is important to understand what the service contracts include, because again, there are instances in which it does make sense. Uh, it's also, you know, I think that if there's ever a moment when you're like, huh, system's not doing quite what I thought it was supposed to be doing having someone check it out um, is highly recommended and don't, don't sit on that for too long um, because you might be able to get ahead of problems um, in the short term that uh, might cause big problems in the long term. Um, can I pick a question here from the Q and A sure, real fast? Of course, sure. So I, I've seen kind of iterations of this question come up, um, but I think that it's important, particularly that AJ and I really address it head on. And when we talk about the environmental benefits of heat pumps, there's a lot to consider here. Um, Yes, it is coming from an electric grid that is powered in part by fossil fuels. The efficiency of heat pumps that Jay was speaking about earlier compared to the efficiency of even a high efficiency gas system or, or oil um, comes from the fact that uh, a good heat pump can take one unit of energy and convert that into three kind of units of heat or BTUs um, for, the, for this analogy. Whereas even your highest efficiency gas systems at the point of combustion can only take that one unit and get you know 97% of that out. And then still there's distribution loss, which is also true for some types of heat pumps as well. But when we think about heat pumps in the context of the broader uh, grid and the resiliency and, and the fate of our planet, um, transitioning to systems that are plugged in and simultaneously continuing to address the source of that electricity is how we have to attack this. Um, so, you know, RMLD has done a tremendous job and it really is a leader in the state in aggressively greening their grid, sourcing electricity from renewable um, uh, resources when possible um, and, and taking precaution to plan ahead and effectively retire uh, old fossil fuel sources and, and, and backfilling. Those. So Jay, I don't know if you want to expand on that. Yes, that I am really very excited to talk about that. This. So right now, as of this year, 26% of our um, energy mix is non-carbon. A good chunk of that is nuclear. Um, and every year that's going to scale up 3%. So next year actually is going to be 30% non-carbon. If you have a solar system, which we'll talk about later, that will 
offset a lot of that um, grid mix as well, and you'll be even more renewable. If you sign up for Solar Choice, like Travis has, that will also add to that um, renewable energy. If you sign up for Renewable Choice, you'll get an extra line item on your bill, and you can be 50% non-carbon, 75, 100% non-carbon. Um, and basically with the Renewable Choice, we'll just retire extra renewable energy credits so that um, your home is you know, fully renewable potentially. Um, and outside of all of that, um, for the remainder of what, whatever we're um, re not retiring certificates for, that is just the regular New England grid mix, um, which is like two thirds natural gas. Um, and then a smattering of like wind and solar from around New England. And then in a pinch, oil. Um, there was almost no coal in, um, in the Massachusetts grid system. Um, and uh, the further development is going to be in hydroelectric and in wind, hopefully. Uh, and uh, we are watching all of that very closely. Uh, and uh, where there is renewable energy, um, we are jumping on it, which is also why we have a very, very good solar rebate. <laughs> I would say, I mean, that grid is only going to continue to get greener over time. It's only going to continue to abandon fossil fuels, particularly as the economics continue to play out where wind, as an example, is um, in many cases already the, the cheapest fuel source. I think that there's always going to be questions around, um, you know, kind of the, con the, the anticipated continuity of that power and what happens if the wind's not blowing. And, you know, we're working um, as an industry. Uh, to develop and continue to build on technologies, whether that's uh, innovative types of storage, but also just using less electricity. And there's this kind of funny paradigm where you know we are having, um, from a policy standpoint, encouraging folks to move and really commit into decarbonization on kind of all levels of their life. But we're also, as those things move in that direction, having them make improvements so that they are using less themselves. And so. You know, there's no one kind of single, this is the, this is the answer that solves all the world's problems, um, but it's a lot of steps that we're proactively taking and a lot of different components that are converging to help make uh, ideally our air and water safer for all of us and uh, earth that's habitable for kids in the future. Yep. Great, great answers. Okay, next, I know this is a very um, topical and um, hot button topic right now so <laughs> um very recent so breaking news here so will the inflation reduction act further lower the cost of heat pumps if so is it wise to wait it will definitely uh offset the cost of heat pumps in some way uh we're not quite sure how um a lot of this is cool we have these big numbers we don't quite know how they'll be implemented yet. We don't know what the terms are going to be for that um, heat pump tax credit, which for context is up to $2,000 to offset the cost of a heat pump. That assumes you have $2,000 worth of taxes to pay. Um, but also, I'm not sure how that interacts with other things in that particular section. Um, I don't know when it will be effective to. I don't know if it will cover 2022 retroactively. It probably will. Um, and that's just for that one tax credit. You know, there's also other rebates that are coming in. I don't know where those are going, how those will get administered. Um, the, the big line items are um, the income tax credits for geothermal heat pumps is going back to 30%. Um, I know- For uh, solar as well. For solar as well, which is very exciting. I know someone asked about uh, geothermal heat pump rebates. Um, currently, we don't have a rebate for geothermal outside of that very, very tasty income tax credit, which is not through us. Um, we might put together a rebate for geothermal because I know people have asked and some folks are moving in. So that is on uh, my whiteboard of deranged ideas. <laughs> um, it's a thing we're working on. Um, is it wise to wait? Um, there's also issues with supply chain stuff for heat pumps. So uh, you might already have a few month wait list. So yeah. I would say to, go with when, when when it works best for your home. Right. Yeah. And I, mean, I think that two things to kind of build on that. One, we do we do anticipate that the 
uh, tax credits will be retroactively applied to 2022 projects. We're not clear yet on some of the rebates that are based on income eligibility. Um, I suspect in the coming weeks, we'll have a lot more clarity on how this is really gonna shake out from an implementation standpoint. And that's where, you know, Abode will be uh, working closely with uh, our clients like RMLD and customers and contractors to make sure it's fully understood and fully leveraged to benefit the residents that it's intended to help um, at the end of the day. So we're uh, keeping really close eye on it and uh, we'll definitely share in the coming weeks uh, as we have more more concrete answers that we can provide for you. Okay. Um, and then Ajay also mentioned, sorry, Julie, the, uh, the supply chain side of things. So um, across our entire economy, we've seen supply chains impacting a lot of our, our daily lives. Heat pumps um, and HVAC are no exception. Um, so if you are considering heat pumps, one of the things that we definitely recommend is don't wait until your system has failed to move down that path. Um, if you find yourself in a scenario in November and your boiler goes out and it is out, it is time to fully re retire, it's, it's done. Um, you know, you're gonna find yourself in a really tough position if you're wanting to adopt heat pumps really fast. Uh, you might get lucky and then might find a, man, a local installer that has some equipment that is right for your situation. Um, but more likely than not, we are seeing, you know, in some cases, a couple of weeks to, depending on what the customers are having installed, a couple of months um, in wait times for different pieces of equipment. And so um, a big takeaway is that don't, don't wait until the system's totally failed to begin thinking about how you're going to replace it. Okay. Um, yeah, and then we have, I think two here, uh, or I guess one for hot water, but yeah, just as a reminder, definitely recommend heat pump hot water heaters. Um, again, I'm a, I've had one for years here and uh, it's been fantastic. Uh, there are a number of considerations to think about when you're getting one, including like, do you have a finished or unfinished space that you're putting it in? Because that'll impact kind of some of your comfort. There are also systems, um, there's a, a system that's kind of focused here in Massachusetts. It's a solar assisted heat pump hot water heater that basically combines the best attributes of solar thermal um, that can be placed kind of really anywhere outside of your house, as well as a heat pump hot water heater and maximizes both of those. Um, if my heat pump hot water heater uh, went out today, that's what I'd be buying. Um, and I think that they're, they're really great solutions out there. And heat pump hot water heaters are part of the Investment uh, Recovery Act there, as or sorry, the Inflation Recovery Act as well. So, um, that's something that we'll, we'll be trying to flesh out and better understand. And here's a real genius move to keep in mind. Most of these heat pump water heaters are smart water heaters. So if you sure. get a heat pump water heater and get the rebate for it, and you sign up for our time of use rate, you can program that heat pump water heater to only run during off-peak times. So, heat, so water heaters use about as, much, about as much energy as an electric car. So if you run that heat pump water heater only during off-peak times, you're going to save a lot of money, especially if you're switching from, say, an oil water heater. So that's that's the real strategy. Good time of use as well. It's great. Good, very good point. Okay, next question. How do you control heat pumps? It's all wizardry. Uh, <laughs> um, most, all of your heat pumps typically are going to come with either a dedicated remote if they are the indoor ductless systems, either floor mounted or otherwise, um, or if it is a central system, uh, you'll have a thermostat on the wall, just like any other kind of system. A lot of these can be interconnected, whether it's with, you know, your Nest or Ecobee or other kind of smart thermostats. Um, there are also a lot of third party uh, solutions out there. Um, Sensibo and Flare are companies that make basically uh, infrared communicators with your system. So I, I, I use a Sensibo one at my house that um, has allowed me to turn my, uh, my heat pump into something that I can control from my phone. So I can check on it when I'm out and about. Um, if I need to do anything, change it, uh, I can do that. Uh, I try not to touch the thermostat, um, but if I need to, or if I just wanna see how things are going, uh, see the uh, precipitation, uh, I have that ability to do that for my phone and it's a super cheap add-on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if I have a combination boiler water heater, how do I heat my water if it is removed? Heat pump water heater. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, they're they're more expensive than regular electric water heaters. I'll 
let you keep that in mind that are like, I don't know, thousand dollars, two thousand dollars, something around there. Yeah, um, around that. Yeah. So they're pricey, but they save you a lot of money. Um, I spend about eight dollars a month on my hot water. I've got everything metered in my house, so like I'm feeling really good about my my heat pump hot water here. That's excellent. Um, so how do heat pumps interact with a solar system? Brilliantly. <laughs> Any elaboration yeah. or just uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> done? The, the 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 real the real like um, the real power comes in during the summer because again heat pumps are also air conditioners, which means that there's a very very strong correlation when when your solar system is at full blast and when your air conditioner is at full blast. And in those situations, basically like you know during the past couple of heat waves, it's extremely sunny. It's also extremely hot out which means that your solar panel is directly powering your heat pump. And normally people have extremely high energy bills uh, during the summer. Um, you will have that problem less so because your solar system uh, is offsetting your electric use during the summer. It's extremely cool. Okay. So now um, th that wraps up our submitted questions. So now we can dive into the live questions. Um, I see some redundant questions. Um, I think we touched on this, but maybe um, people joined later. So we're getting questions for the average cost of a heat pump. And I know that it varies yeah. widely. So I don't know if there's some kind of range we can give or I can kind give of scenarios. Gut estimates. Um, I have seen a lot of whole home systems that are on the order of magnitude of like $20,000, 30 if you have a large home. And they're pricey systems, but like that's the rough order of magnitude. You're looking at like a 20,000 dish plus or minus 2,000 plus or minus 5,000. Um, keep in mind, and this is part of this big whiteboard here, um, that if you wanted to replace a boiler, in a way that means that no one's coming back to refix the boiler in a couple of years, that's going to be costing, you know, $15,000 on its own. Um, so really the incremental cost is like six, $7,000. Um, lop off the rebate to, you know, say your offsets like three, $4,000. And you'll probably save that much just from another winter if you're going from oil. So they're pricey. Um, you know, we're looking at setting up some kind of financing option. Um, we'll see where that goes. Um, but yeah, so that's the rough cost you should be looking at. Um, so you have the, uh, sticker shock now and not when the quote yeah. comes in. Yeah. And I think that that is too, again, when you're having a conversation with one of the heat pump specialists as part of this program, once we dive into your home specifics and start to understand more, we can really kind of help get you into a range of pricing to expect. And I hope you to understand kind of the why behind it um, without being sold. So Bode, again, like we don't sell heat pumps. Um, we're purely here to help you make a, an informed decision and support you along the way. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of data on the systems that come in and I've seen a few questions here about like, uh, you know, if you have a 100 amp service or a 200 amp service, those are all kind of things that add up into the cost. So your existing site conditions can impact, you know, uh, what your cost is gonna be your existing distribution. If you're someone that just says, I really wanna have duct work, I don't wanna have any of the indoor wall mounted heads or, or otherwise, um, then adding new ductwork is going to be expensive, particularly in Massachusetts. It's one of the most expensive states to add ductwork um, because of the licensing requirements. And that would be true if you were adding central AC. And so I think we have to kind of uh, realize that when we're talking about heat pumps with the exception of a whole home system that is utilizing existing distribution, in all circumstances, we are now adding both generation and distribution to a home versus a simple boiler or furnace replacement where you're just replacing the generation of, of the heat source. And so contextualizing it that way is certainly important and understanding what you're getting and the financing uh, options that are out there, whether it is um, through products that might be coming through uh, utilities, uh, through Mass Save, they have a 0% interest heat loan if you're a national grid customer. Um, local banks often are looking at these types of projects favorably as well. 
Um, and depending, if you talk to a, a real estate agent, they're going to say it's going to add value to your home uh, to boot. So there's other benefits out there, but they, they are not, this is not a $5,000 for a whole home system. In a debt also, situation. another major benefit that I hammer on quite a bit, no NOx emissions, no SOx emissions, no carbon monoxide. Absolutely. My, my childhood bedroom was right next to the boiler in, my, in the home. And we, we had someone come in to take an inspection and they were like, this thing is belching out carbon monoxide. I could have died. Um, so this, so the carbon monoxide is an important one for me. Um, just to follow up on a question someone had, if you have 200 amp service in your home, you're good. Almost always. Not, Almost always. Unless you, have, unless, you have like a, <laughs> unless you have like a knives out size home, 200 yeah. amps is fine. And, and that, that we also, I think when we're talking to folks and thinking about those upgrades, um, we're actually seeing a lot of folks opt to go from a hundred now straight to a 400 amp service, if that is possible, uh, depending on what can be brought in from the street. Um, and the reason for that is that folks are planning for the continued evolution of electrification of their home. They're planning for their EVs that they're gonna be buying or they might already have. They're planning for that induction cooktop stove and they just wanna make sure that they you know, are giving themselves plenty of capacity within the house. Okay, that's good. Um, so there's a question about if a rebate works on a pool heat pump. I'm Does not, unfortunately. Is, yeah, okay. Um, are dual fuel systems eligible for a rebate? Yes. Um, so for context on dual fuel systems, um, it's basically, you know, you have your old fossil fuel system and you have a heat pump on top of that. Um, I mean, if it's a brand new fossil fuel system, there's no sense like throwing it out, but you shouldn't need to kick it on. Um, and in that kind of situation, we recommend, uh, not require, we recommend you have some kind of integrated controls so that when you turn one thermostat, it controls both the heat pump and the fossil system. Um, so it's totally workable, whether you're doing a partial system or a whole home system. Um, it would be nice to have an integrated controls, but you don't have to. Again, talk to the contractor. Every home is different. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go start with the earlier questions and we might have touched on this but how many air source heat pumps are needed for a house that's 1700 square feet so i guess how many units our house has six rooms without counting the basement and i'm wondering if the option is worth it in a house like ours yeah yeah i mean so as, as you've heard me say a lot it depends uh depending on like your floor plan for example if if you've got a house that has um, a relatively open floor plan with rooms that communicate with each other. Think your kitchen, dining room, uh, living room areas. Uh, you might be able to get away with one unit that can effectively condition that whole space depending on where it's positioned and, and kind of where those rooms are in relation to one another. Um, then from there, you start to get into some of the sizing or some of the design configurations that we touched on in the presentation around uh, either uh, a, a short run ducted system or, uh, you know, in some cases, we actually see folks that opt to not have a distribution in a certain room because maybe it's a room that is just not used that often for whatever reason. Um, and so they just leave the door open and it gets, you know, conditioned enough. And then if there's ever, you know, a need for additional conditioning in that day or in that space for a certain amount of time, then maybe they do use a space heater for a couple of hours or a couple of evenings if they need to. But um, there's a lot of ways to tackle it. And again, the the nice thing is that the, there are a lot of solutions out there and knowing kind of what your concerns are and what you're needing to ask contractors really helps expedite the process. So uh, to the person that asked that question, I mean, setting up a heat pump consultation um, and then kind of having a list of questions to go to a contractor with can help make sure that you're getting solutions that are going to effectively address those concerns. But we see small capes, large capes, ranches, big colonials, every configuration you can imagine uh, adopting heat pumps uh, daily. Okay, so next question. I am planning an addition to my home and I plan to use an air source heat pump to control the new space. Can I get a rebate if I replace my existing HVAC propane burning at the same time? Absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, 100%. It'll just be a one rebate that covers the entire house at the new larger size. Um, yeah, it'll work just fine. Excellent. Okay. 
Um, will a heat will a heat pump interfere with my existing heating and cooling system? Can I use my current way of heating my home with oil and central air? If you're going with like a whole home heat pump, it's going to completely replace your air conditioner um, and it'll replace 90, 95, 100% of your oil system. Um, yeah. Yeah. If you got a partial yeah, system, then you'll have to finagle that, but a whole home system should replace both. I mean, again, coming back to, we do see folks that, um, you know, may have purchased a house and the system that is in place might be an oil system that was replaced five years ago. So it's not time to fully yank it out, but they don't want to continue to use it for all the reasons that we've talked about today, but they leave it in because it, why not? It's a little bit of safety, a piece of mind redundancy, not necessary, but it does kind of come to understanding about what's, uh, what your tolerance is and what you want. But these systems, when they're sized to design properly, can definitely achieve what you want. Okay, that's a good one. Okay, so you mentioned the rebate was a thousand dollars per ton. What is the average cost per ton for supply and installation so we can determine the typical cost of the homeowner? And I think we kind of <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Um, can ear can air source heat pumps be retrofit to use existing baseboard heating or will it require coated hot air and duct work if you can get one of those air to water heat pumps i think it should work yeah. just fine maybe um yeah, depend on the, the size of, of the of the piping um, yeah or the, the panels but yeah i mean there's yes ish <laughs> <laughs> depends on who you talk to depends on yeah. if you can find a contractor with that equipment another question is there a large difference in efficiency between ducted and ductless system, assuming a new ducted system. So if you would have asked me that question two or three years ago, I would have said absolutely. Um, but we are seeing a lot of the newer ducted systems. Um, Daikin and Bosch have, have brought out products that are performing really well. And so um, it does kind of come back to that chart that I showed early on about the kind of cost to operate these systems. Um, each manufacturer right now seems to have products that perform really well and some that, some that don't perform as well. So I think that, uh, you know, get some quotes and then bring it back to a boat and we can help you understand how, how they'll likely work. Okay. So this is a question um, in regards to an example that we used. Um, so what- oh, The big graph sphere? you used. Yeah. Um, yeah. the SEER HSPF rating is yeah used. yeah so the SEER is essentially uh, focused on the cooling efficiency and the HSPF on the heating efficiency uh, both kind of seasonally adjusted um, the thing that's interesting about that is that you know the manufacturers as part of their kind of accreditation of their products have to do testing and have submittals for what the products will be but the, that is not normalized data for New England better yet Reading. And so that is one of the things that when we're doing uh, kind of quote comparisons on our end and doing the analysis, we're actually looking at those systems based on our geography, our heating degree days, meaning how many how much of the year we add a certain temperature um, and uh, discounting essentially those manufacturer specs. And that's why on that chart that I showed, a manufacturer might say our system has a, a let's think about this in terms of like how efficient they are. It's called the coefficient of performance or COP, which means like how much energy comes out from one unit of energy in. They might say that our systems have a coefficient of performance of 3.5, but then when you actually look at how many heating degree days we have throughout the season, the seasonally adjusted coefficient of performance for the system might be closer to two, which is not that good. And so that's where our analysis on our end can really help someone uh, take what might be seemingly very similar quotes with different products and, and arrive at some different conclusions about how they're actually going to operate uh, in your home. And this is not unique to any one manufacturer. As I've said multiple times, every major manufacturer has equipment that is looking great and equipment that is a little bit of a trade-off and compromise, but they might be cheaper up front. So there's lots to, to balance in the decision-making process. Excellent. And to follow up on a question that's also here, um, for our requirements, we require uh, a SEER of 16 and an HSPF of nine and a half. Higher is better, um, but those are the minimum requirements. Thank you. Excellent. 
Okay, so another question here. If the heat pumps are always sized based on the heat load, will that mean there is always enough capacity built in for the cooling that is needed? For instance, my AC unit struggled this summer to keep up and frequently was unable to keep the house comfortable. My concern would yeah. be getting not enough cooling capacity. Yeah, if it's sized for your heating capacity, you'll be fine on your cooling capacity here in New England. Um, you should also and, look at weatherizing your home as well, because uh, that yeah, often is a, that's often a huge reason why um, ACs and furnaces struggle. It's because the house is kind of drafty, and right. you know we have a lot of older homes in our service territory, and a lot of them are a little drafty. So, Excellent. go for the home energy audit. Yeah, good plug. Okay, we're um, getting towards the end of questions here, so I guess. Um, if anyone has any last minute questions that we didn't address, um, speak now. Um, you can always <laughs> ask us after the fact, but um, we want to make sure that we address everyone's questions um, who are here tonight. So last call for questions. And what is the best spot to place an outside unit out of direct sunlight, under a deck, et cetera? Um, yeah, so I mean, I think that there are a lot of considerations that go into this, including like where the distribution is gonna be at. So you don't wanna necessarily have the lines running to your interior distribution heads um, going too far or longer than a manufacturer would recommend because then you have some loss of efficiency there. But you know, we typically try to have folks uh, keeping these um, more so outside of areas where they're gonna get debris or covered by, we talked about snow as a big concern. Um, the sunlight's less of a concern um, and in some instances, I, I've heard of installers trying to optimize for exposure just because during this, the winter time, when the efficiency is really needed, it can help give you a little bit of a marginal boost uh, on, on the ambient temperature around that piece of equipment. Um, I have seen some installations under a deck, but you do need to make sure that you have ample airflow around it because if these systems do not get enough airflow, that can cause the motors to strain and ultimately wear out faster. Um, so there's you know, there are some best practices, but they're more focused around height off the ground, not under a drip line, uh, and thinking about kind of snowpack or, uh, or snow drifts uh, during the winter time. Okay. Um, I'll also note, I don't know how many historical districts we have in our service territory, but oh, if yeah. you have, if you're in a historical district, you may have some extra requirements about where those outdoor units yeah. go. They'll probably need to be out of sight from the front, and they'll probably need to have hidden line sets. So for example, like if the lines are on the outside of the house, have to be repainted to match the color of your house. So keep that in mind if you're in a historical district. Oh, interesting. Okay, so there's a question here about the expected cost range. I think we answered that as- It might be a little more expensive for a three bed. Oh, okay. uh, depends on how big a three bed cape is. No, I mean, I think that generally, again, get, get a couple of quotes you're gonna find. I, I would be willing to guess you're gonna find quotes that range from 14 to 20 something for that size of home. Um, and it'll just depend on the kind of technologies that they're presenting. I do, so just in this, for the sake of time, we have like a few minutes left. I'm, can I check through a couple of these real fast here? The sure, first yeah. one and that last one on there. Mm -hmm. So you do not have to work with any specific contractor to be eligible for rebates, but the contractor does need to go through the uh, pre-approval process and uh, submit the final uh, QA as well as the wiring inspection. Uh, those are explicit requirements regardless of who you use. Um, that last question too, um, which I think I kind of just disappeared for a second, but um, no, it's okay. The, um, if, if you wanna chat with the boat, I mean, right now um, we are typically scheduling out a couple of weeks for uh, our consultations. Um, but when customers, when projects are submitted for pre-approval, we typically have those done within a couple of business days. Um, and so that will, that should never be a barrier to you getting them installed. Um, we have a team, uh, multiple folks working throughout uh, Mass and Connecticut doing these consultations. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of demand for this right now. And so uh, we are seeing folks getting scheduled out uh, two to three weeks out currently for consultations. Um, on the question about the Mr. Slim systems, yeah. if it was installed five, six years ago, it should be a cool climate unit. You should be good on that respect. Um, and uh, you probably won't need to replace it for another five, 10 years. Um, as for how much of the system can be reused and the, how much of the cost is to replace systems, I don't actually know quite yet. Yeah, the, the replacement of the systems and kind of mix and matching old with new uh, gets a little bit complicated in the sense that the technology advancements over the last, you know, 
10 years have been dramatic enough that uh, you might be able to reuse your line sets um, and your and some of the, the kind of pieces that are connecting them. But I doubt you'd be using kind of a, a new outdoor unit with an old outdoor, uh, sorry, new outdoor unit with a old indoor head. Yeah, so I think that covers um, and the replacement cost. I think, right, we covered that yeah. as well. Um, and Ajay, you're answering the Mueller question. And we are at 8.30 on the nose. So I think we fielded probably about 70 questions, which is <laughs> wonderful. <Rapid fire. laughs> My goodness. <laughs> um, so some additional resources. So be sure to check out our air source heat pump guide and these additional resources um, with our partners. And these links will be in um, the follow-up email that I'll send in the coming days. So don't think you have to jot these down. And lastly, thank you very much for attending. I'm always blown away by how engaged and curious and inquisitive our customers are. So it was a great turnout. The questions were wonderful. Um, yeah, and Ajay, Travis, if you want any parting words, that's all from me. So thank you. Yeah, this is super fun. Um, keep in mind that if you have any further questions about how the rebate program um, works on like the RMLD side, um, you can just call us. Um, and I'm, I love talking to customers and I'll more than ha happily help you out with, um, figuring out, um, all of these, uh, program details. Cause the key thing is that like, I'm on your side here. I, I want you to have, I want you to have a comfortable home and an efficient heating system. And I want to make sure that if you're, uh, if you're doing this, that you get your rebate that we asked that we incentivized. So we're on your side here. Okay, everyone, um, that concludes our Q&A and info session. Thanks again for coming. And um, we will see you again soon. And stay tuned for more news and webinars. And if there's anything else we can help you with, you know how to find us. So thank you again. Take care. Thanks all. Take care. Bye. Yeah, bye. And here, recording and...